Hello, and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by VTA Marketing. Are you still using 20th century techniques based on psychology to sell your products? Well, move into the 21st century and get your products sold through neuroscience marketing. Amygdala, dopamine, frontal cortex, serotonin, emotion, decision making. All of these things interact to create a space where a product is either bought or not. By hacking the neurocognitive architecture involved in reward and decision making, we create a perceptual emotional experience that influences both episodic and procedural memory, altering uh, future buying behavior. Scientifically evaluated by our team that includes at least one cognitive neuroscientist, our p-hacked, post-hoc, and underpowered analyses will overwhelm you with our ability to beat other marketing approaches. Uh, we'll show you the psychophysiological, eye tracking, and fMRI studies um, that we tap into uh, your brain to make our product the bell of your customers, Pavlov's dogs. Let me say that again. We'll show you our psychophysiological, eye tracking, and fMRI studies and to how we tap into the brain to make your product the bell of your customers, Pavlov's dogs. There we go. So mention the keyword engage brain to receive a discount on our amygdala package and scare 10% off your order price. Apple or Samsung, Chevy or Ford. Every day we make dozens of decisions, oftentimes between two almost equivalent options. But after we make our choices, we'll sometimes start to wonder if we actually made the right choice. In order to stop feeling bad, we'll look to all the positives of the thing we did buy and all the negatives of the thing we didn't choose. If we don't follow this process and stay stuck in the bad feelings, then we'll experience post-decisional dissonance. Today on the podcast, I speak with Hassan Ahmed about decision-making, the brain, and what happens after we make a decision. All right, well, thank you for coming in. Uh, I'm here with Hazan Ahmed, and we're talking about post-decisional dissonance. Yeah. All right. Uh, so can you tell me how you got interested in uh, post-decision, uh, decision-making? I mean, I've always been interested in how um, the brain uh, works and how it, like, interacts with our daily decisions and um, helps us, like, to, like, live in, daily li- in, in today's world. And, um, I mean... I used to be interested in how it affected how music was influenced by the brain um, and these days when I've been looking at like the different decisions you've seen especially with elections how um, people are like choosing peop- um, candidates that you would not expect them to choose um, it got me interested and curious about how what processes in the brain actually like lead us to making such decisions yeah yeah and also like the findings that um, the research we, we've been doing uh, mm-hmm. on decision making yeah. um, has like really got, got me even more curious because I was really um, surprised by um, the results that I didn't think they were going to be like that. Yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about our results? Yeah. So um, we found that um, people weren't, people even who had to your mind um, weren't particularly, particularly like great at certain tasks that you would expect them to be. Like we did a short story task. Mm-hmm. Um, where they read a story and like had to answer questions and some of them relating to the emotions of certain characters yeah and like some of them even those like we expect that most college students have um, theory of mind which is the ability to read uh, people's emotions um, um, and um, we didn't and most of them didn't actually get those questions right um, so it, like it was a bit confusing results and mixed results that we didn't expect to find. Yeah, and I think it's a lot better task than it had been used in the in the past. Yeah. Uh, so I think we pulled it from a article from like 2014 or something like that. So yeah. I think we're the only the second people to use that particular task. But uh, I think it's a way better measure of theory of mind than just asking people um, faux pas questions and yeah. things that have been used in the past. And I mean the the study on the on how people make decisions like. When, when you propose um, to give them ten dollars and they have to share it with someone else mm-hmm. I mean that's also very interesting like are you trying to, are you making a decision based on fairness or are you making a decision based on how much you personally get or how much the other person gets it's like I think this really shows that decision making is really 
uh, something that's not like um, universal to mm-hmm. everybody like everyone has different um, ways of making decisions and that's really what got me interested was I told myself there must be something in the brain like experience or like past emotions and ex- um, that really influence you in the way you make y- your decision yeah. yeah because like I mean every day we make decisions like probably like tens of dozens of decisions mm-hmm. every day right like small decisions like you're walking down the street which way do you go yeah. and I mean those decisions we don't really talk about but they all are actually the result of a very complex complicated process in the brain mm-hmm. yeah and so uh, maybe outside of our uh, research uh, what other uh, re- interesting research findings have you found uh, in your uh, search for th- the brain and decision making I mean this this article I really like um, I really heard uh, really liked uh, was on bias remorse uh, for those who don't know bias remorse is um, something that I, I mean like probably everybody experiences um, when you buy something and then um, you like like a day after you start regretting it you say like oh I should have got this one this one is better um, and I mean it's a very like annoying feeling to have mm-hmm. because especially when you've invested a lot of money in it um, but it occurs frequently because um, your brain like when you're deciding between two things you always end up deciding something because of like time pressure mm-hmm. or uh, peer pressure someone's like waiting for you yeah and and then when you re- regret the decision you like you don't really enjoy the product you've actually bought mm-hmm. um, so I was really interested in seeing how one can reduce this um, dissonance as you call it or bias remorse mm-hmm. and that's what really got me into um, researching more and I and decided to like make a video because I mean like everyone yeah. everyone's interested in how to um, reduce such a dissonance and this horrible feeling we all get yeah yeah and so the video you just rec- or you just uh, mentioned was the neuroscience of decision making yeah exactly up on YouTube uh, have you um, it seems like there's been dozens of views yeah over 50 views two up likes I was I one mean, of the I mean there was like um, I I think I uploaded it twice oh, so okay. the other the other one has actually like 250 views oh wow okay so um, yeah um, yeah, I, like I didn't expect it to be like, such popular, like especially that this is my first video. Oh yeah, here it is. I see 200, 245, So over three, or close to three hundred views across the two. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's my first video I've ever made, and um, I really got inspired by this actually from um, this channel, this YouTube channel, which is called um, ASAP Science. Mm-hmm. Um, it basically makes these fun videos about um, uh, curiosities in science, like daily questions we all have mm-hmm. like I mean like the sense of what would, what would happen if you drank soda um, for every day of our life or okay. stuff, stuff like that yeah. or like um, they also have like the sense of love and like question like these cool things and they do it really well they do it like with um, with animations and mm-hmm. all this and that's what really like told me like I was really um, attracted to the way they they did it like I really liked it and I was like, I really want to do it like that, but yeah. I mean, I don't have those tools. Right. Uh, so I uh, go, went on my computer and I started researching the different uh, programs or uh, websites that would allow me to do this. And that's when I found Powtoon, and I saw that they are very like they're very professional and they give a range of options uh, with like ready-made animations. But at the same time, you have to make like the timeline. You have to f- you can add pictures from outside. Yeah. So that's when. Um, that's what inspired me to make this video. Yeah, great. Um, and then, um, so thinking about it, uh, communicating uh, buyer's remorse or post-decisional dissonance uh, in the scientific way to the public, or is there any kind of confusing aspects of, of the topic? I mean, um, look, if you look at, like, I read a lot of um, research studies, and, like, those really use, like, all these complicated words and these complicated mm-hmm. parts of the brain. I mean, um, and that's like I think that's what uh, that wouldn't really be attractive to the public that they would like listen to this and then say oh this sounds so complicated I don't want to listen to it and um, and I tried to really like simplify um, the actual um, how it actually works mm-hmm. like really simplified um, so that people would like get it and at the same time um, learn something new mm-hmm. uh, but that's at the same time actually scientific that's not just um, something that's based on nothing um, yeah I mean um, I gave some parts of the brain that are um, that network together and um, 
to would allow us to make a decision but I didn't go too much in detail like into like exactly how they interact with each other um, because it's pretty complex yeah. uh, in the way I mean um, with all the synapses and all the all the connections it's like it takes a long time but uh, I just reduced it to like very short and then mm-hmm. I and then I added like a bit of psychology yeah um, less less biological too uh, which is just based on like how we think and um, how it actually applies to like daily life so like that's right. why I gave an example because like that example is like something that probably not everyone relates to yeah um, and I personally don't have any of those um, I don't have an Xbox I don't have a PS4 yeah um, but I just thought about it because a lot of my friends have this and they had the problem they like um, really hesitated between the two. Yep. And um, I was like, maybe if I look up, if I think use um, the process that we use to decide, I would manage to re- show them like how they could have um, approached uh, the decision uh, yeah. when they when they bought it. Yeah. And I mean, like, I think it's very helpful to see an application of. Um, of like decision making mm-hmm. based on um, how on our brains process um, so then we can think about it next time and say that oh it's fine um, our brain will solve our problems for us yeah <laughs> and how about uh, in your research did you find any way to like li- reduce or limit <laughs> post decisional dissonance I mean mainly it showed that um, you have to you don't need to you shouldn't think about um, w- the other product you um, you didn't buy mm-hmm. like um, you should always like um, tell yourself that this product is good is good enough because if we always uh, think about the, the thing that we don't have then we will just like always never be happy with what we have mm-hmm. and I mean um, especially when we have like big investments like some a product costs over like two hundred dollars yeah um, just like all products have their advantages and all products have their disadvantages and we can't always um, be like saying oh this product has disadvantage but has this adva- disadvantage we just like it just be like a continuous debate mm-hmm. um, so what I found was actually that um, it's recommended that once you have your product not to like look at that other product at the product you didn't buy instead just concentrate on the one you do and just like just like be happy with it. I mean, um, this you can always go to a friend's house or someone else who has the other product yeah. and just like use it. Like I mean, in this case, it's pretty easy. You just go to a friend's house and you use their Xbox if you have a PS4 or yep. the other way around, and that way you don't feel bad. You say, okay, I I get the most best of both worlds. Like I get to play on mine and and I get to use the other one. Yep. So I mean, that's one thing. It's called I think it, um it's called um adding a new condition that's like one of uh, Festinger which is a very uh, famous Mm -hmm. psychologist um, proposed as a way of reducing cognitive dissonance Mm -hmm. and then I mean the other the other way is um, just to like pray like like this is mainly done by the brain like you Mm -hmm. don't really need to do it consciously like the brain automatically knows that there's no way of buying the new the other one so they like automatically tells you uh, makes you feel better about the one you have and worse about the one you didn't buy. Yeah, so, I mean the brain pretty much helps you out, but you have to also have to have like a positive attitude and not always be like not happy with what you buy. Yeah, I mean um, you always have to make a decision in life, and you can't have both. So mm-hmm. yeah, we yeah. talked in class about how uh, there's kind of two broad groups of people who make decisions: satisfiers or satisfiers and maximizers, the yeah. satisfiers just look for uh, the product that seems to satisfy their minimum requirements yeah. and then they stop looking. The maximizers will uh, look until they find the ex- the um, dream product that fits every single one of their criterion. Yeah. And uh, the researchers had found that uh, people who look for the perfect product were far less happy than the people who just kind of go with what works best uh, at the moment using the mi- least number of uh, conditions. Yeah, so like um, making a decision, just like you just want to get the job done, basically. Just yeah. like just want to um, um, like find something that suits you, and mm-hmm. not something necessarily that like fits all your criteria, but yep. fits a maximum number of criteria. Mm-hmm. And there'll never be anything that like perfectly suits you. You just have to look for something that 
uh, you think you will, you will want to like use for in terms of buyer's remorse yep. um, for like a long time and that you'll be um, happy with mm -hmm. the problem today maybe like today you have a solution in some way because a lot of like in terms of clothes you can like buy clothes and if you're not happy with them you can like return them yeah. but I mean with more um, durable and like um, sustainable products you need to be ready to use it for a lifetime so mm -hmm. that should be like a criteria when making a decision yeah. um, and you, you should really evaluate the two products and really see which one you will you think would be the most durable and you'd like the most you'd be able to like use the most during your mm -hmm. life um, as opposed to the other one yeah and it seems like products are trying to get into uh, that area too like cars will give you however many nights to drive or yeah. uh, beds mattresses will give you like 90 days to like use yeah. the mattress to have you kind of experience something before you yeah commit to it for life I mean that's another thing you should experience um, something before you buy it mm -hmm. and that way um, your brain will tell you like oh I had a positive experience and then so then that will um, lead you to making to buying that product and if your brain decides that no it's not something for me then yeah that will also help you out in making your decision because mm -hmm. I mean in making a decision there's like many things that um, are like criteria like the brain um, looks at memory looks at past experiences um, how you felt about them um, specifically with the amygdala which uh, interacts closely with the hippocampus mm -hmm. and um, like evaluates like says like this oh you've tried this product um, you didn't like it that much um, or you, you didn't try this product but you liked this product yeah so if you re if you're like satisfactory with you're satisfied with this product you sh you don't need to look at the other product mm -hmm. or stuff like that um, and then the frontal lobe is like more like a reasoning and like judgment like just like looking at um, like listening is generally like um, objective um, advantages and disadvantages of the product yeah I mean um, that that's how it, it doesn't really look into emotions or subjective feelings about them it just like oh this product lasts for um, 10 days without charging or things like that mm -hmm. and then there's your visual um, cortex at the back which um, looks into um, how like visually appealing it is but I mean that really plays a role yeah um, when we're looking at things like you wouldn't for example buy um, buy a car which isn't like doesn't look really nice mm -hmm. and that you don't think other people will like yeah uh, yeah so how about uh, going forward do you think that there's any like new or uh, exciting areas of research and decision making I mean pe people are really um, I think um, uh, like entrepreneurs and uh, are really trying to um, show show their products like uh, as um, something that you can use all your life and that they're trying to sh um, in integrate the possible disadvantages you think about them mm -hmm. um, and find a way to um, substitute them with advantages like saying like um, this may not, not do this but it can do that okay. and that really helps uh, the buyer which who, and we don't have to do it like if if they when they show a promotional video on, of their product and mm -hmm. they say like oh this may not be able to do this but it can do that which is much better and that really helps um the consumer out uh, when making the decision which mm -hmm. we don't have to do that themselves they like help you out in that yeah. way um, and people are aware um, of this buzz remorse uh, which happens very often so um, really trying to like show like that's that's the thing you talked about like they allow you to like return it after many days mm -hmm. and all that so then they still you still have the opportunity to like um, come back on your decision yeah um, yet um, you you also like the the shorter they make it, mm -hmm. the more it puts pressure on you to like decide. And yeah. when you are when you're under pressure, it helps you to really like say, okay, this one, this part I don't like of this one, and this part I like. So I mean the pre like I mean at the same time both of them are are bad are good and bad. Mm -hmm. I mean some products they allow you for like lifetime to return, and some yeah. products they allow you like two days. Right. And both have advantages actually because like lifetime means that you're that it helps you making decision because you know you can always come back and, mm -hmm. and change it and when you pressure on you know that um, 
you really have to look at the like the main aspects that are pleasing or displeasing. Yeah, yeah. I always thought that the lifetime uh, warranties or lifetime returns. Um, I'm trying to think like Lands End or Eddie Bauer, like those kind of clothing yeah. companies. Like they're really relying on sunk cost fallacy where. I've already spent all this money on it and I have it I'm too lazy to like go back to the, yeah. the store and return it uh, so uh, they just get people in and with that lifetime um, possibility of being able to return it yeah but people just don't do it uh, all right so maybe wrapping up here uh, is there anything that you'd like to promote or talk about I mean I I, I suggest that you should definitely check out this um, except science yep. um, channel I mean not all of the videos obviously are appealing or and they might be a bit um i mean like a bit uh rash mm -hmm. i mean like some of them are really funny like that stuff like um the science of sex or um the science of not uh, imagine you not you don't sleep for a year what okay. will happen to your body yeah so like fun things that people think about but like mm -hmm. you don't really think there's any scientific aspect to it so yeah. they try to show that there actually is mm -hmm. so i mean those videos are pretty pretty fun and they also like like I really during the summer I like, spent watching a lot of them and it's really helped me with like thinking about like top possible topics of research mm -hmm. and that's got me digging into um, like studies so I definitely suggest you to check it out yeah and then uh, maybe the last one uh, any uh, fad or item or anything that you think is really interesting um, well actually uh, my brother is um, making um, uh, starting a new company um, and it's called Main Tool, um, and it basically makes um, smart watch straps. So like you can like a normal timepiece, and you can just attach um, a smart strap to it, which would be and and you would, like be wearing basically a normal watch, mm -hmm. um, but um, you wouldn't see the electronics, but it still has the same functionalities. Like it would be able to track your heartbeat, uh, track your footsteps, uh, track your sleep cycles. Um, they, they there's even like a integrated button in the strap that mm -hmm. will allow you to like reject phone calls, call, um, make emergency phone calls, and you would get like vibrations when you get like text messages. So I mean like I think that's a really like a new industry that not like wearables is like a huge industry that's really growing today. Mm -hmm. But I mean this is a really smart one because it's integrate is like combining the best of both worlds, like the world of classical timepiece and the world of like. Um, new technology mm -hmm. so I think you should definitely check it out it's um, uh, check out main tool it's like M-A-I-N-T-O-O-L um, and yeah All it's right. not available just yet but <laughs> it uh, is definitely um, improving um, these days and it's really um, uh, it's probably going to be um, be out soon yeah. in the next few years well, good. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for taking some time uh, yeah. on a weekend to come in. Yeah. <laughs>thanks so much to Hassan for stopping by, especially on a weekend. Uh, I think I was having some post-decisional regret for po placing or post-decisional distance uh, for placing available times on the weekend for the podcast, but I had a lot of fun um, speaking with him. Uh, and as we start to wrap up the show, uh, we'll get to uh, the last two segments, uh, although maybe we'll just call it one and a half. Uh, we'll start with uh, Jake's Jams. Uh, these are the things that I've been uh, finding interesting lately. And uh, something I really have to say that has been great for these podcasts has been the Zoom H1 that I've been using to record the podcast on. Last year when I first started trying to record the podcasts, I was just using my phone, uh, an Apple iPhone, uh, with the uh, standard Apple iPhone headphones uh, that have the uh, place that you can speak into, the microphone that you can speak into, and have the head buds in. Uh, and it just didn't sound all that great. Uh, I think I ended up recording maybe two episodes, one just talking about why I want to get into podcasting, and the uh, second one uh, on an actual neuroscience topic. I think it was uh, looking at 21 uh, unsolved mysteries of uh, neuroscience from Ralph Adolph, so a paper that he, he wrote last year. Uh, but the, they just didn't sound all that great. Uh, maybe it was the place that I was recording, uh, but I think a lot of it had to do with the recording device. 
Uh, so I, I think the Sony H1 uh, handy recorder uh, that I've been using uh, has been great uh, with uh, bi-directional mics and uh, the, the kind of pop guard uh, and everything. Uh, the sound quality has just been a lot better, uh, especially um, in a still not great in recording environment uh, to be making these podcasts. Uh, so definitely something that's been um, helping me a lot lately. And then the last segment that uh, will hopefully be working in the future, I still haven't seen anything on Twitter. Uh, my uh, handle, EngageBrain, at EngageBrain on Twitter, uh, or uh, an email uh, to my last name at gmail.com. I haven't seen any uh, questions, but in the future I hope to answer questions. And uh, the mailbag, reader mail, or tweet me, uh, whatever the segment call is going to be called, uh, once uh, somebody actually starts asking questions. Uh, so n- nothing going on there, uh, and I'll wrap up the show. Uh, so thank you so much, and talk to you soon.